All right, so hey y'all. Um, I am a, a water conservation specialist here at the city of Greeley. Um, my background before that, I worked at the Gardens on Spring Creek in Fort Collins as a horticulturist. And before that, um, took care of all of the enhanced medians um, over there as a parks technician and did a lot of irrigation work there. And then worked for a couple of uh, different like fruit and veggie farms um, prior to that. So come with um, you know a little bit of definitely plant focused background um, with a hunk of irrigation as well. And then I do um, have my certified landscape irrigation auditor's uh, license. Um, I'm a qualified water efficient uh, landscaper and sustainable landscape manager as well. So I'm just trying to collect all of those letters, as many letters as I can get. I'm gonna put them behind my name. <laughs> um, so I'm here to talk about irrigation and I'm working on two screens here. Got it. Um, so first, what is drip irrigation? I mean, I assume you guys all know because you're you signed up on the class and are interested, but the big things is that it's low volumes of water that are applied um, under low pressure, um, and then it's directly at the root, so where the plants actually need them. Um, though it is commonly, it's most commonly called drip irrigation, but um, you'll see other things, um, point source, uh, micro trickle, uh, bubbler, soaker, irrigation. So you'll see those other things, but it all kind of means the same thing. Um, I would say generally speaking, drip is the most common, um, the common term. So when to use it, I would say um, any sort of narrow strips are perfect for irrigation. Um, the little right-of-ways like turf, um, little sections um, along the roads, just drive me crazy because inevitably you're going to have um, sprinklers that are bubbling out into the street and over into the sidewalk. Um, alongside that, any sort of high wind areas. Um, I know Alt Greeley is high wind um, in general, but um, especially if you end up in a home where you're, the surrounding buildings maybe make a little bit of a wind corridor, drip is a perfect, um, perfect irrigation for those areas. And then any sort of slopes, um, you know, water flows downhill. Um, and so a lot of times whenever you have overhead irrigation, it's just really easy to over apply and then inevitably things are just kind of running off. So drip because you're applying a lot slower, that water that you're putting there tends to stay where it is. So slopes are a perfect, um, perfect place to room. And then just in general, just like any non-turf area um, and anywhere that you want to save some water, um, drip irrigation is definitely a great option. Um, there is such a thing as subsurface um, drip, which is often um, used for or can be used for turf areas. Um, I'm not really going to talk about that. I don't have a whole lot of experience with that, um, but you can use that as well in turf areas. So why is it better um, than the system or the zone that you currently have? I would say there's a lot of cans, hypotheticals, like what, what can you achieve? And, um, you know, it can overcome if you have that uneven terrain. Um, it can prevent any sort of discoloration on housing or fences that you might have. Um, it can reduce your water bill. Um, I've seen a variety of statistics, um, you know, up to 60%. It can reduce foliar diseases. So that's diseases that um, are of the leaves um, or start in the leaves. Um, whenever you're applying irrigation overhead, things set, water settles on those leaves. And sometimes depending on the timing, will just stay there for a while. And then it's really easy for for bacteria or fungus to come in and just ravage your plant. So if you're putting the, the water at the roots, less likely to have that. Um, you can reduce weed pressure as well. Um, you're always gonna have a weed seed bank in your soil. Um, and if you're not applying water everywhere and you're only applying it right at the, where you want on that plant, um, less likely to kind of encourage those weed seeds to germinate. Um, higher uniformity and efficiency because you're really targeting where your water, where you're putting your water, um, and then just overall less water um, loss due to um, all those things I have listed there. <laughs> um, because again, you're putting it just like right there at the spill. How can it be inf um, inferior? Um, I would say the biggest thing is that people a lot of times put in drip irrigation and then they never touch it again. And when that's the case, it's really easy to um, avoid that regular maintenance that needs to happen. So like filter cleaning, um, it's easy just to like, yeah, well, you know, all the plants are alive, so it's fine. Um, just any of those regular checks that you do need to be doing on any irrigation system. So um, it can just be easy to ignore those things. Uh, it can be easy to not notice those clogs or breaks until it's a little bit too late, until you see it like plant just like 
totally suffering <laughs> um, because you know it is under a layer of rock or a layer of of uh, mulch that you just might not notice it. Um, so definitely just gotta keep an eye out. For this is true of any kind of um, in ground irrigation system, but um, a lot of times it, it really bugs people that they have to like dig away that mulch in order to do that maintenance. Um, and then whenever you do that, if you leave it exposed, it can be a little bit of a trip hazard. So all the more reason to have a nice thick layer um, of mulch on your on your shrub beds. Um, and then one last thing is that it can be a little bit easier to like nick um, than traditional uh, traditional overhead irrigation lateral lines because you're coming through and you're doing spring clean outs or you're um, you know just doing a little snip here or there or you're digging in because you want to move a plant somewhere and so it's just it's a little bit easier to um, accidentally cut that line um, and hopefully you notice it right then and there um, but sometimes you don't so but you're here so you want to do it um, which is cool <laughs> so the first step I would say is to decide where uh, where are you wanting to make a drip conversion? I guess, um, most likely maybe with um, in conjunction with a landscape conversion as well. So decide where and then call 811. Um, you can also do it online. Um, usually give them about a week. They're usually there in like a day or two, but um, definitely call them before you start doing any digging. And then activate and observe um, all the zones that are in the area that you're talking about. And so I have these four um, little symbols because they're the things I definitely want you to be doing. Um, activate those so zones and then you need to go walk that zone. You need to go around to each little head. You need to see what's happening by it. Um, you need to be listening. You need to be um, like trying to figure out like do you hear any sort of gushing gushing? Do you ever hear a weird squeal? Um, any of the, any of those are kind of an indication that something else is, is going, going wrong. Um, and then I have this timer because um, a lot of times uh, the timing of how long it takes between you have turned it on on the clock and it's taking a while for any of the heads to pop up, that can sometimes indicate that like you have a pinched line or you have a broken line, but something is causing your heads not to pop up right away. Um, so just kind of pay attention to that timing. What we're trying to do here is get an understanding of like what is the current status um, and then it'll kind of help inform what version of convergence you want to do. Um, you kind of want to get an idea of if I make all these changes, what might still be remaining if I touch nothing else. So just to get an idea of what you got. And so with all that information, map it, map it, map it. I'm going to say that a thousand times tonight. <laughs> map your stuff. This um, is on the handout that kind of went around, um, but wanted to put it up here as well. And it's just kind of a general um, placement on how an irrigation system would be set up. Um, you're gonna start with getting the water um, like at the house going through a backflow device, backflow preventer device. Um, and then that's whenever you have the start of a main line. Main line feeds into a valve box where you may have one or more valves um, and you may have additional components in there. And then after the valve, that's where um, what you call lateral line begins. And so in this um, diagram, they showed it's polytubing. Um, that will be what you would do, that what you would use for um, a drip system. Um, but what you might find in your current zone might be PVC. Um, so it might be that solid white plastic. So the main line is um, what is serving um, the entire irrigation um, system. Um, and so there is water under constant, once, once your system is on, um, you have water under constant pressure between the backflow and your any of the valves. And it just kind of, yeah, there's just water in, in that area. And then only water starts to move once one of the valves has turned on, and then you have dynamic water going through that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, for any sort of in-ground irrigation system, it would either likely, likely um, be PVC, so solid, hard, white plastic, um, or it can be poly. Um, sometimes I would say like that's pretty rare, um, but you, you do see, some, see that sometimes. Then your your main line, well, so you don't, 
there's probably not, you can to get little, your main line in that situation would be all about this long. It would be that tiny little section because you would probably have, if you could try to compare this to this little, uh, the little diagram, this is my controller. Uh, it's not here, but a backflow uh, little preventer would be right here. Um, and then a pressure compensator and then a pressure reducer or a, sorry, filter and then pressure compensator. So your main line would be right here, right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that goes to the spigot. No, well, I mean, yeah, it, you could put it here, you could put it here, um, but it would need to go before the pressure reducer or the filter and then anything that it would serve. Yeah. All right, so told you to go observe and go map. Um, and then these are kind of the big things that I want you to keep an eye out. Um, Cause again, you're trying to ID the things that um, are not gonna be fixed by doing a conversion. So any sort of heads that are popped off because your snow removal folks might've might hit it, um, a mainline break, um, any sort of gushing water, like any sort of geyser. Um, if you're walking around and you step into something and you sink a couple inches, definitely a big deal. Those are all the things that you should be taking, taking a note of, of that they're there and then where they're at as well. These are also a couple of good ones. So these top two um, photos indicate that there's low pressure. Um, those little pop-ups should be extended all the way. If they're just kind of, <laughs> they're kind of going and they're kind of spraying, um, there's not enough pressure in that line. Um, that's something that you should it, you know, take note of, but then further investigate because again, it could be pinched, uh, pinched line from roots. It could be a crack. Um, it could be a clogged sprinkler body which would be like the ideal, uh, but it can be from a couple different things. And then um, that bottom photo kind of shows, um, it could be a number of different things. It could be that the, um, that the sprinkler body is not settled on correctly. It might actually just be a crack in the sprinkler body. Um, there could be a couple different things that are going on there, but again, notice, um, take a note of it and um, investigate it a little bit further. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, any anything that you'd know. And then you're going to map it. Um, so on this first photo, uh, those are kind of indicating the, um, the head locations. Um, the different colors indicate the different zones, um, but kind of the heads are the easiest thing that you'll notice as you're walking around, you know, um, everybody sees these, like this is easy and obvious that this is a head. So maybe that's where you start. Um, and then from there, you can kind of make some assumptions. Maybe you know for a fact, cause somebody left you drawings um, on where the lateral line um, is from, from there. Um, I have here, um, I have these, this BF, that's my backflow um, indicated that it's, that it's back here. This V is the valve box. Um, and so there are three valves here that are serving this green, this blue, and this red as well. Um, over on the right, um, the solid lines are like, I either know or I'm very, very confident on. Um, and then the dotted lines are kind of the ones where I'm just like, well, I'm not 100% that there's line there, um, but that's, that's kind of my, 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 my feel, my, my, my judge. Um, when you're doing that mapping, include everything that you know. Um, so drainage and elevation changes are huge. Um, we're gonna go into one of the uh, conversion types where that is gonna be especially key. So make any of those notes and indicate the head order from the valve. Um, you know, the closest one to the valve um, can, you you might know that literally just cause it's right there as, as shown kind of on, um, on this photo. I'm doing two things. Um, and then um, on this red zone, so like I said, I don't actually know that I have that dotted line right there, but the head that I have labeled one um, is the first head that always pops up whenever, whenever I'm turning the zone on. So that's, that, that's kind of like, well, I'm pretty sure that that's number one. So again, you're not gonna maybe know 100% of everything, but take your best guess. Um, and just indicate like where, where you where you think things are happening. 
So you've mapped it all, um, and now you have three different ways that you can convert um, that you have to decide um, which one you're going to do. The first one is you can um, do these uh, little retrofit heads. Um, they're usually typically sold as kind of kits, um, like these little guys that it might come with a variety of different bits and bobs. Um, this, the photo um, up on the upper right is a, the installation of a pressure reducer filter in line, um, so on the lateral line. And then the last one is that you do an actual um, valve filter pressure reducer assembly. Um, this is sold as like a unit. So rather than just like adding little parts like one at a time, you just buy this whole thing as a unit and you install it. Um, so you can do any of these three and we'll kind of talk about each one. Regardless though, the big things is that there's gonna be a pressure reducing component. There's gonna be a filter um, component. You're gonna have to address, address or uh, attach drip tubing. And then you have to have some kind of emitters. Um, and then that is, you gotta have all those things for irrigation. Um, two big things, turn off your water before you start digging, turn off your water before you uh, start messing with anything at all. Um, you can do that at the backflow. Um, if for some reason you don't have a backflow, uh, you can turn it off um, at the like stop, the, the water turn, shut off valve um, of your house as well. Um, so you should have a backflow preventer, very important. <laughs> Um, and also before you bury anything, test, 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 test. Um, so, you know, you've picked your method, you've done it, you've done all the work, it looks beautiful and you're ready for the landscape. Don't bury it until you test it because let's find a leak now before you find a leak in 10 days. Um, yeah, so uh, water, if it gets siphoned backwards, it can have all sorts of stuff in it. It can have dog stuff, you know, dog duty in it. It can have herbicides, fertilizers. It can have all sorts of stuff. Um, whenever you have that siphoning of water that goes backwards, the first folks that are going to be affected, potentially like in an adverse health way, are going to be the people in that house. Um, and then, then eventually it can get into like water supply, you know, the, the city supply, which we definitely don't want, but um, it's, it's just a health, a health concern. Yeah. It's also required by the city of Greeley as well, but it's for health. All right, so the first method that we're gonna detail is using these retrofit heads. Um, and so essentially what you're gonna do is you are going to pick a head or two um, at the end of the line and you're going to um, take it from being a regular old sprinkler head and instead you're going to install um, this, little, this little retrofit head. So inside of here, there's a filter and there is a pressure reducing component. Here's my little filter. And here's my pressure reducing component. Sure. Um, yeah, so, and then what you're gonna do with the, with the other heads is that you're, <clears throat> so these, these are any of the other heads that are in the line, you're gonna take out this, you're gonna cycle it, and you're gonna cap it. Um, these, these are called um, Zeri caps. Um, they are brand specific to, uh, to Rainbird. And so if you have a hunter heads, use the hunter caps. If you've got orbit heads, use the orbit heads. But you do need to use that, that specific um, brands type. Um, but yeah, you just cap it like that. Because you're just abandoning it. You're essentially, you're just not gonna use it because yeah, you're only going to now get water from that single head at the very end. Um, No. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna repeat question because we're doing a Zoom recording. Um, so the question was um, if, um, can we run, um, you know, sprinkler and the drip off of the same, um, off that same zone? Um, so if we're turning one into drip, can we leave the other ones as sprinklers? Um, to run them, you know, 15 minutes and cover it. Um, I'd say no, um, because those are just very different plant um, plant requirement need, or water requirement needs. How much water turf needs, and then how much um, like you know regular old shrub needs. Um, both the frequency and the amount is very different. So 
in order to keep one healthy, you're going to either be drowning the other or you're going to be starving the other. Um, so definitely no, say no go on that guy. Uh, so where are you going to make the changes if this is the version of retrofit that you decide to do? You're gonna put it at the end of the line. Um, that end of the line. Um, the, other, um, the other point to keep in mind is also um, at the lowest point in the system. So I kept the numbers on, on this, um, on this di diagram, this map, um, that shows the heads that I would convert. So for the blue and the, the green, it's pretty obvious, you know, it's the last two in the line. Um, for the red, number two is actually the lowest head on, the ent on that entire zone. So I'm definitely gonna have to convert over here. And then both of these are the ends of the ends of the system. Um, these little retro heads are very cheap. Um, you might tr be tempted to like, well, I'll only do it on number five and I could skip number two and it could be okay. It's, um, these are so cheap that adding an additional one is the best insurance for making sure that you're not gonna have water stuck in those lines freezing after you, for the after the first winter that you first made this conversion. You don't wanna have these long runs of, of leftover tubing um, that are gonna get freeze thaw, freeze thaw, you're gonna get cracked. Um, you're just gonna have to dig it back up. So putting it at the end and putting it at the lowest level, uh, lowest elevation is really, really important. So um, this version of conversion, um, when is it a good option? Um, I would say you've gone through your whole, um, you've gone through your whole uh, mapping and you, you know the quality of your system and you had no indication of any sort of funny heads that weren't quite um, seated down. You had no indication of any sort of pipes that were broken. Um, you feel confident that what's in the ground up until that very last head is good. I think this is, this is a great option. I'd also say that um, this is the least labor um, version of conversion. So um, I think for those two, those two reasons alone, this is, this is a good option in those cases. So I'm gonna play um, a couple little videos real quick on just like quick and dirty on how to do this. Before you remove the spray head, make sure to turn off the sprinkler system. Carefully getting down on the spray head, unscrew it, and set it aside. And now you're ready to install your drip system. And this is a drip converter head. It contains a pressure regulator and a filter inside it, so you don't need to add those separately. Simply screwing the, the converter head on, put the tape on, and then screw on an adapter. After the adapter, attach the T-mount. To the T-manifold, we're going to attach the distribution line. The T-manifold has a special connection called a compression fitting, so you can just push the half-inch tubing into it. It's not going to come out. All right, and so what I have passing around right now, um, those are a couple of different versions of what you might see um, having a lateral line and then a head that's connected into it. So you might have this little, that kind of goosenecky little one. Um, you might have um, just a little bit of funny pipe, um, or you might actually have a head that's um, screwed basically more or less directly right into that lateral line. So when you when you dig out, you might see just a variety of different things. So I just wanted to show you what, yeah, what you might come across. Um, once you have removed that head, like she showed um, in the video, um, then then you have to make a decision on, on capping it. So um, can cap it, like I showed you earlier, um, and then she's also going to show a, a different version. For a more solid conversion, dig out and remove the spray head like we did earlier. But this time, cap it off. Take care not to get any dirt in the line and be sure to tighten it securely. After you've completed converting, so um, yeah, this kind of shows you what you guys had on your in your hands there. Um, depending on what that connection is into that lateral line, you might have to add a little nipple um, so that you can put a little cap on it. Um, 
And alternatively, so instead of doing a cap, you can actually do an inserted, um, an inserted cap, <laughs> cork, uh, a threaded cork. Um, yeah. Plug, thank you. A threaded cork. <laughs> Here um, are just kind of a couple of varieties of the kinds of retrofit um, or retro kit fit kits, retro heads, fit heads that you might see. Um, so they're going to come with different bits and bobs. Um, the, let's see, upper right um, is actually um, this one that I have here. Um, I personally like don't really care for ones that come with a whole lot of little extras um, just because like inevitably you're going to have like not enough of the emitters and then like too much of this other plastic stuff that I don't really need. Um, or I don't want to use the, the little uh, spaghetti, um, the little spaghetti guy. Um, so just keeping it pretty simple with just the, um, the filter and the pressure reducer and then the, the additional little attachments. Um, just keep it simple, I would say. So that's using the retrofit kit head or the retrofit heads, the retrofit kits. Um, their second option is to um, put the pressure reducing filter in line. So this is going to be in the lateral line. And you have a couple different options on where you're going to put it. Um, your first is going to be just immediately right after the valve. If you have enough room, you can put it immediately after the, the valve in the box. Like that would be the ideal. A lot of times you just don't have the room for that though. So otherwise, so you might do it just right on the other side. And so you can see where I have these um, these two little stars for the blue and the red zones. I mean, I would I could put it literally just right there. Um, and again, you're just you're putting as one assembly. You're putting in both this this uh, filter as well as the pressure reducer. Is what you're going to do in this process. The second option is to um, put it after the valve, but before the first head. So, um, you know, for the blue line, this really wouldn't change where I would pick to put it. For the red line, um, this has actually had a whole bunch of gravel in a way that was like, I'm not going to dig through like six inches. Well, a whole lot, whole lot of mess in the compaction of the foundation. Anyways, it was easier just to put it out here. Um, but again, that's before the first head. I know that's the first head because of how it, how it operated um, whenever I did my inspection. And your third option is that you can kind of put it elsewhere in the line, um, but you do have to put do put it before any sort of branching. So um, I definitely would need to put it before this point right here, just before before where the red um, where the red branches. Um, I would be careful about this option. Um, what a pressure reducer is doing is it's reducing pressure. And so, um, you know, if you have 60 PSI water coming and then all of a sudden it hits that and it like some of the heads behind it had experienced that, but then the line below it has 25, um, you're kind of just, uh, you might be reducing the life of any sort of components that you have there, um, kind of wear and tear. Um, so I would say just like be a little careful um, on that version. Um, and so I would say that like doing the changes um, using as an inline installation, it's a good option when um, you know that your valve is still good quality, you know that it's performing well, um, but somewhere along the line, you know you have a lateral break and you want to make that change before that lateral, lateral break somewhere along the lines. Um, and maybe you don't want to have that little retrofitted head like above grade and you want everything that happens to be below grade and you don't want to see it at all. So it, it would be a good option for, for any of those. These, I wanted to show a couple different options on what you might see. Um, the first one, those are both Rainbird versions. The second is um, a Hunter version. Um, you, you can do other ones as well, but it, you know, professional grade products are definitely the way to go. Um, two things that I wanted to specifically note is that these units will have um, this direction. They will have this arrow. That's important to pay attention to. Um, you need to install it um, so that you're pointing downstream. So um, the arrow is going towards where the plants are. Um, that's, the, that's the big thing to keep in mind there. Um, also the different, different styles, the different models, they both will regul regulate to different levels of pressure, but they will also provide different levels of water. So this right here says, 0 0.2 um, to 5 gallons per minute um, versus the lower one is able to supply up to 15 gallons per minute. So um, depending on the size of your landscape, depending on the how heavy water using the plants you install are, 
you might need different sizes. So that's just something to kind of pay attention to. Um, I also wanted to just kind of like show you real quick on how to maybe like the, how you read some of these products. Um, and so, you know, when you go somewhere, you don't necessarily need to say, I need an HFR-07. You don't need necessarily need to do that, but this seven, 75 is going to indicate three quarters of an inch. So like 75 cents is three quarters of a dollar. Like it, that's kind of like the idea behind it. And so um, that's saying that both the inlet and the outlet are going to be that three quarters. Um, and that 25, it's better, it's regulating to 25. If you have different sizes of inlets versus outlets, um, the first number is going to be that inlet. And the second number is going to be the outlet. And again, what's what's your what's the PSI that you're regulating to? So just a little, little help on maybe how to explain what you need to, to folks who are helping you. So um, with you, the installation of this inline pressure reducer filter, um, you can do a couple different versions of this. The first, you can um, install it and then you can um, keep it originally attached to that PVC. So if that PVC was still in good, you know, in good uh, material or in good shape, um, and you know that you don't wanna start your drip, uh, drip tubing right there, right where you install this, but you wanna start it like way later down, um, this is a good option. Um, so you dig it out, you put the, the pressure reducer filter in it. Um, you're gonna cover it up with a, with a valve box so that you know where it's at you're going to have to clean that filter. Um, but then you're going to have to continue to make additional changes later, um, later in the line, kind of, kind of like you have to in that um, retrofit kit. So you'll have to maybe add, um, you'll have to replace some of those heads with little risers that will have adapters to get you connected to some drip tubing. Um, you, yeah, and then you ultimately do need to have that last head in the line um, still be able to be blown out in some sort so that you can get rid of all the water in it. Um, um, the second option is that you put this, um, you put this pressure reducer filter um, in it and then you abandon everything downstream. You're saying, I'm not gonna touch the rest of that lateral. Um, I don't want it anymore. I want my drip irrigation to start right here. Um, and so that's, um, that's kind of what the photos here show. Um, if you look in the first photo, you can see this is where the um, lateral line was originally going. Um, and what this, what we did here is that cut into it and decided, oh, no, we want to actually put this all right here. And then we're going to run drip line as soon as we're past the pressure reduced filter. Um, two things I wanted to um, make a note of specifically on here is that anything underground that you install, um, please do use these barb um, these barb connectors. Um, in that video, she talked about compression fittings. Compression fittings are good. Um, barbed uh, couplers are much better. Um, so you insert them and then you put clamps on them, um, pinch clamps or these little rotating clamps. Yeah. So could you... uh, if you use compressions, I would only use them above ground. Yes. Um, so a uh, couple of things, you know, even if you are immediately switching over to drip line, you still do need that valve box because again, you're going to have to get in there. You're going to have to maintain the actual um, device. And then if you um, start your drip there, please do use sleeving. Um, over time between the earth just kind of settling and you getting in there and stomping all around it, that drip tubing is going to collapse. And so you need some sort of sleeving. And so whether that's a stronger piece of poly that um, just kind of goes around it or an old piece of PVC that you have just something. And that's this right here. Um, that's kind of the sleeving that's shown. Um, and then this is the actual line that's gonna provide water. Um, and then this will be right there. All right, third option um, is to actually switch out at the valve. And so what you would see is um, a lot of a control valve assembly. So they're just saying like, We've got all the bits and bobs in one little bit and here's your assembly. So it has the valve um, right here. It has the filter and then it has the pressure, the pressure reducer right here. But you just buy it as a whole unit. Um, and again, this is kind of that expanded view um, that you would have it all in one um, in the valve box. This they had um, 
they had evidently like installed it separately because you got a little union here and you got a little union here rather than buying the assembly. But the assembly has all of them just kind of combined in one nice neat little package. So if you do that, where are you gonna do it? In the valve box, man. <laughs> Um, and so you're going to look for those for those green um, those green um, rectangles. Sometimes they are green circles, um, but you're going to look for those. That's where your valves are going to be. Um, and so looking for that, that's what you're going to replace. If you have multiple valves in one zone, like we did in that previous slide, you need to figure out well, which one am I converting? Like if you're not converting both, which one am I doing? And there's a couple different ways that you can do this. The first, um, the valve might have a little tag on it. A little less common in residential, but it might it might have that little tag on it. It might say six, so you know it's zone six, which that's the ideal. Um, the other like kind of easy ways to know which which one you're doing is by sound or by feel. So have somebody turn on the controller, um, and you're at the valve at the, at the valve box. I would put both my hands on both of the valves, and as soon as they turn it on, you'll hear a click, and that's the solenoid. That's the solenoid. Once you know that, then you know which one got activated. Um, you might also be able to like feel that click. Um, you can also sometimes feel the water going through it. Um, and you can also just kind of hear the water going through it. Um, so both of those are, those are great options. Um, I've also heard of folks, they'll put a really long um, uh, screwdriver and they'll just kind of like put it on the valve and put it up to their ear and that, that'll vibrate just enough that like they can't figure it out any other way, but they can tell that way. Um, but you can also tell it in a much more methodical way, um, which would be definitely the gold standard, I would say. And that is to match your um, the colors of your wires. Um, so most residential setups, you're going to have kind of um, some seating that has a bunch of different wires in it that are different colors. And those different wires are gonna go to different zones. Um, and then they're also gonna be get connected at your controller. And so, um, you know, look at look at the zone that you're investigating and see, oh, well, like it looks like it's connected to blue. And this is a rat's nest of, of a picture. But um, so you're just like, OK, it's connected to blue. Uh, trace it backwards and oh, it's, look, it's on zone two. Or again, you can go the other way. You can like you can turn on, turn it on from the clock and trace it either which way. But um, matching those colors will get you to know which zone you need to be cutting out. And so to do it, you will need to cut on either side of the existing, uh, the existing valve. Um, I would give my, I would give yourself more space than you think. <laughs> Always give yourself, actually, you know, cut out a little bit more, I, I would say. Um, people love to cut it too short and then they want to jam, a, they want to, they want to twist that, that PPC just a little bit and then maybe make it work and then you crack it. Um, so give yourself a little extra room um, whenever you're doing that. So you cut on either side. Um, and then I have circled here. I don't know if you guys can tell. You see there's an arrow pointing down, pointing to the left, my left. Yes, your left as well, <laughs> um, to the left. So that's that direction of water that you wanna follow. Same thing right here. There, we're, gonna tr we're gonna match the arrows that we're going in the same direction. Um, you, know, you, li you likely will need some bits and some bobs to be able to connect what will be a threaded cord to this smooth PVC. The bits and bobs. And then um, on the downstream uh, side, you're also going to need some little bits and bobs in order to connect um, to that drip, that drip tubing. Um, because you're, you, if you're doing this version of a conversion, you're abandoning everything, everything else that's, that's downstream. And again, it's below grade. Please use the barbed, the barbed version. At the valve, um, because you're adding more stuff in it, you may have to size up. There are different sizes of those valve boxes. Um, and then I would say like fill for future use. So like make it a cleaner hole and like maybe put some landscape fabric down in it. And then like maybe have the, the box actually like sit on some bricks. Um, I know it's like extra, but it'll make whenever you do have to inevitably do some maintenance on it, it'll make it a lot nicer. So you have three methods um, and now you have to decide which one are you going to do. Um, and so you have to consider all sorts of stuff. First, you know, what do you know? What do you know and how and how good is the existing zone? Um, and then also like how comfortable are you in making these changes? Um, or how comfortable are you in researching and learning more about how to make these changes? Um, so that's just kind of a, a feely thing of like, where do you feel on it? 
I'd also say cost and also, um, you know, how long do you want the, the system to perform? Um, the, the more expensive ones are going to last longer. <laughs> Those um, retrofit little heads, they get hit. Um, they are, you know, they are $12. Um, so they are gonna they are gonna fail before doing the full zone in some um, assembly like replacement. Um, but over time, maybe that's that's fine because you know your timeline like that. You know, you just got to make those those kind of um, trade offs or those comparisons. I'd also say the aesthetics and like how much of the landscape are you willing to disturb? You know, do you are you okay with potentially like digging out a whole area and then like maybe you also sort of want to bury your your drip line with under some seating? Um, you know, that might lead you to one version of the conversion or versus the other. Maybe you don't want that little retrofit head above grade that it just like really bugs you when you can see it. So just gotta kind of kind of think about it. Um, also your physical ability, your patience. Um, and then your plant timeline. If you need to have this this drip irrigation um, conversion done yesterday, those little those little retrofit has the way to go. Um, you know that takes two seconds versus doing any sort of the other like um, inline or the valve conversions. They're going to take a minute. You also have a decision on what kind of drip um, you want to do. The biggest things is that they should be pressure comp the the whatever you choose should be pressure compensating and should have um, check, check valves, check emitters within them. Um, and so that the pressure compensating, although you have a pressure reducer in the line, pressure compensating is gonna make up for the fact that maybe you have 200 uh, feet of a straight line um, and you wanna make sure that the, the plant at the end of the line is gonna be getting the same water that the plant at the beginning of the line is getting. Um, also, if you have um, a change, to, you know, a change in elevation, a significant one, same thing. You want the plant at the top of the hill to be getting the same at the bottom. And then the, the checks um, prevent the uh, emitters from leaking uh, after the zone is already turned off. You don't want it to continue to just kind of. So the first option um, in line, um, a lot of times like I'm most familiar with just calling it Medifin, which is the same as saying like Kleenex and Vaseline. Like <laughs> there's a variety of different, um, different makers um, models. Um, but in line um, means that you have um, the drip tubing and actually it already has the emitters already like in it and they have it at six inches or maybe 12 or 18. It's already preset. Um, and the way that you're going to use this is you're going to create a grid pattern. Um, and then uh, essentially you're watering in, in that same grid. And so you can see um, how the water like overlaps in this perfectly placed version of inline um, drip. Um, and you do still need that blowout port at the end there shown. Um, I would say it, this effect, the effectiveness definitely depends on how well was, it was installed, was the right product chosen for the soil type, um, how flat of an area did you install it. So just be, be mindful about it. Um, my little favorite is definitely using button emitters with um, the quarter inch tubing. Um, people call it spaghetti tubing, uh, micro tubing. Um, the, they come in different colors. The different colors indicate different amounts of water that they're going to put out. Um, big thing on this is that I really, really, really recommend that you put the drip or that you put the button on the distribution um, line and then you run a then you run tubing from it, not the other way around. It's really easy to kick this out and then it, this pulls, you know, then the um, then the connection here pulls out and then now you just have a giant geyser popped up versus if the drip tubing comes off of the button emitter but the button emitter stays in place, well, it's no longer reaching your plant but you're not having a geyser. So it's a little, little bit better. So I do definitely say, don't do that. Do it this other way. Um, also a little adjustable multi-streams, um, little bubblers, um, you know, those are both great ones. I really like the multi, the adjustable multi-stream um, for um, the fact that you, that you basically, you can make it like from one gallon up to, I think like 10 maybe. Um, and uh, it's really nice for, okay, I'm putting a whole new landscape in. I want to water it a little extra for it to get established. But the next year, instead of me having to pull out and put a different emitter in, I could just I can just, I can turn it one. So I do really like that. Um, it definitely, I would say, doesn't have as much water savings as the button emitters potentially, uh, but they are, they, I think they're a valuable tool to have. 
Ruth said, good in container gardens too. In your pots. The whole lot of notes for me though, um, don't mess around with foggers, misters, or soaker hose. Micro sprays, I don't, I don't really like micro sprays. I think that they're just sprays. Like they're just, they're just sprays. Um, you're not gonna see as much water savings um, with micro sprays. I think they waste a whole lot, um, but you will see them in your drip in your drip uh, section at your local uh, local store. So a couple questions. Um, do I have to convert all the zones um, that are serving the area? Um, depends on a couple of things. So um, it depends on the diversity of your plant's water needs and then kind of, I mean, and related to that, the diversity of the microclimate. Um, so something in full sun is gonna need different than something in, in shade. Um, if you have an area that um, you want to have an annual garden and, and, or a veggie, veggie garden, but then you also want to have a native area, yes, you need to have different zones. Um, in the case of kind of the, the um, example house I've been using here, um, yes, I would definitely need to be converting um, the red zone. Um, but instead of doing the, both the blue and the green, given the narrow area and the low plant um, palette, I can get away with just, just converting the green and just abandoning the, that, that blue zone completely. But I would say the number one consideration of if you need to convert both is that the water that you pull, the water that you are applying to your plants has to be less than the water that is provided. If that's flip-flopped, you're not gonna have the pressure. You're not gonna end up having enough water to the plants. You're gonna have to have very long run times. And it's just like, it's, it's a poor design, it's a poor plan. Um, so you, you need to be pulling less than what your system can provide. And so to figure that out, you, you do need to do some calculations, rough calculations, they don't have to be perfect, but you do have to kind of think about it a little bit. Um, and so I hear, you know, just an example of, all right, well, if I have 30 of these low ones and then I have 50 of the very low plants, um, let me get an idea on how I can actually uh, figure out how many gallons per minute am I going to be pulling because um, on that remember I showed that um, the different pressure reducer filters will have that listed of like what is the pressure they can provide and what is the value of the gallons per minute they can provide that's where you want to make sure that this number is lower than whatever it can provide so here you know as long as I had something that could supply um, a, min, um, a gallon per minute I should be fine um, if you decide to do the inline, um, the inline uh, drip, uh, the drip tubing, they have a gazillion charts and they're perfect. Um, I didn't pull, I didn't pull them up just because like you literally just say like, I'm at this pressure and this is how many, you know, this is the length of the, or the square footage that I want. Oh, I can run 400 square or 400 feet. Um, so real simple charts to just follow. So how do you pick what type of drip? Um, Depends how closely planted is everything. Um, do you want what you have planted to continue to spread um, or reseed? Um, the, then you know netafin is a great, a great, great choice. Versus something in this second, in this uh, like bottom photo, that's pretty sparsely planted and it has a very like um, neat and tidy little look. Um, and so if you put netafin on or inline drip. Um, on that, you would just be watering a lot of landscape. You don't need to be watering. It's just it's just a waste. So um, it, it definitely depends on kind of how you want this to look. I'd also say it depends on the plant type and what are the plants, the diversity again of the hydrozones. Um, if you have, if you want to have a rose next to some yarrow, um, those need very different types or the amounts of water. And so if you have both of those in with inline. Um, irrigation, they're going to get the same amount of water. Versus if you use the little button emitters, you can decide, oh, this one gets a half gallon and this one gets two gallons. Um, you can kind of make those, those decisions a little bit more um, actively with the button emitters. Um, and then for plant type, um, you know, it, it, some plants need, they want to spread, they're going to spread, they need to be divided regularly. So um, you just got to keep that in mind for whatever kind of irrigation you do. Cost, always got to consider it. And then installation timeline, again, the, the inline is going to go in a lot quicker because you literally lay out a grid, done. Um, that's it versus the buttons. Um, I have a whole pack up here you guys can come up and play with. Um, it takes a minute. Um, and like, you know, you got to put everyone in individually and then you might put the tubing and then maybe you have to stake the tubing. Like it just takes a little bit longer. So 
um, need to consider that as well as the frequency and likelihood of are you going to make changes later on. When you install it, do it parallel to the slope. No point in going up and down um, a hill. That's just going to make it harder for your zone to actually do what it needs to do. And then secure it with landscape pens. And put it at the edge of the root ball. Don't put it right on the crown. Um, if you put it on the crown, it's just really easy to um, kind of create opportunity for rot. So you're going to want to put it at the edges, not below, you know, not on the downside. Um, put it kind of at the at the drip line. Um, and then if you end up having a little ledge, you know, those are great as well. And then don't forget your trees. Never forget your trees. I'm going to be on a on a tangent for a minute. <laughs> There's a um, couple of great options commercially available for watering your trees. Um, if you're taking out all your turf and this tree has been used to having three days a week irrigation for about that deep, um, it's going to struggle if you just completely take it that away. Um, you can slowly wean it a little bit, but I just I would really, really recommend that you give your tree some kind of supplemental water. Um, so there's a couple different options. And then I really like this. This is something that I used um, at whenever I was a parks technician. So um, I, you basically create a series of unconnected loops. Um, so instead of creating a total loop that's going to eventually suffocate and like grip up against the trunk of the tree, this never actually connects. So as that tree expands, they're basically just going to push those push that circle away. So I think this and this is with that um, inline drip. Follow the drip line of the tree. Um, that might be difficult for a very mature tree because then you're going to be like out 40 feet. Um, but do you know? Do the best you can. Don't put water right up against that trunk. That's not where all the roots are. They're definitely going to be further out. Um, my last little tidbit: um, map, map things. <laughs> map where your ends are out. You're going to know, need to know where those ends are at because you're going to need to winterize. You're going to have to blow out all the water. So you're going to have to unscrew it or you're gonna to have to undo it in some sort of way. So know where they're at or put them in valve box even, boxes even better. Pole zones do need to be converted. Don't try to mix and match um, the, you know, a drip with, um, with an overhead sprinkler. Somebody's gonna be grumpy. Um, and I feel somebody's gonna be grumpy and it might be you with your water bill. Do be careful with digging. Um, a water delay whenever you hit um, the line that you're not expecting to, um, it's just a bummer. It's, it's, it can be so frustrating, so just be careful with that. Don't do landscape fabric um, in, in any sort of beds that you convert. Um, you suffocate the soil. Um, you prevent water and air exchange. Um, don't put it in. Map it again. Map everything so that you know where everything's at. Sleep, creep, and leap. Um, that's kind of a saying people will say, especially for native plants. Um, so the first year that you put a plant in, it's just kind of going to sit there. It's going to sleep. The second year you'll see it grow a little bit, it's gonna creep. And then the third year is when you see it just like in all its glory, um, that's the leap. Um, and with that, managing your watering expectations, um, there takes a hunk of water in order to get plants established. So you're not maybe gonna see that 60% on that first year. Um, you need to get to the point where the plants have taken their roots a little bit further out before you actually get to see, get to see those, um, those savings. Um, observe, adjust, adjust observe, um, you know, a keen eye on the plant's health is really going to save you water. Um, it's going to save you potentially plant mortality and having to replace those plants later on and spending money on those again. Um, over and over again, you know, just observe, adjust, adjust. And you do still need to winterize. You can't just leave a drip, um, a drip zone um, to sit there with water in it. Um, and then um, if for some reason you are kind of struggling with enough pressure, you can um, create loops within your system. I would just be careful with that, that you do need to still have a blowout port. You can't just have a pure circle. You still need to have something that can eventually be opened up to let the, the last of the water out. Last little tidbits, um, do those barb fittings for underground. Um, if you have threaded pieces, um, use Teflon. Um, and you're going to put that on in the same direction that you would screw anything on. Um, and I have some stuff that you guys can kind of mess around with if you want. After this, if you do anything with PVC, you do need to use solvent glue. And then um, use professional grade products. Um, honestly, at this point, like you've gotten this far and you have made a commitment and the cost difference is pretty minimal um, for the fact that you're gonna get something that actually has a warranty for something that can, um, can endure like higher variations in 
um, in pressure, in, in temperature, like the professional grade stuff is just a lot more resilient. Um, and it, yeah, and the, a great place to get any of that kind of stuff is DBC um, here in town, just west of, west of Sonic. Um, and you are again gonna need kind of those miscellaneous bits, and bobs and couplers and connectors. And DBC is great about that. Um, I have gone in there, I'm just like, I need threaded onto this and, but I need it three quarters and then it has to go down to, I can kind of describe what I'm getting at. And um, they're always super patient. They're great guys. Um, they're who I recommend for, for anybody that's getting um, different irrigation bits um, here in town. And by local. Um, housekeeping, uh, do separate for programming for scheduling, separate your drip from your turf onto different programs. Turf, you know, typically two to three times a week during the height of the season. Um, you might need to not need to be doing that on drip, especially after it's established. So put those on two different programs. Um, that way you can change what time of day it's watering, how many days a week, all sorts of stuff. So do separate those. And then um, don't just set it and forget it. Like besides the adjust to observe adjust, um, you plants don't need the same amount of water across the whole season. They need the most in July, but, but besides that, they need less than that. And so there's two ways to do that. You can change how many days per week um, you're watering, which is in this first graphic. Um, and we do have stickers in the back that kind of show this as well, that you can put on your controller. <laughs> Um, but you can also make that adjustment using the seasonal adjustment um, and you just kind of follow this, this little up and down. Um, that way you're not adding a couple minutes on for this zone and adding a couple for that. Um, then you kind of might forget from season to season. Well, how much did I run the zone two for? Uh, it looks like I landed on 12 minutes, but I think I did more at a different time. If you just change the seasonal adjust, um, you can kind of bypass that. And so the yellow here kind of shows you where you might find that on your controllers. Um, it's sometimes also called budget. You might see that on a controller, um, but most commonly you'll see um, adjust or seasonal adjust. And then the, these orange little guys are, um, you know, just examples of where you might find um, programs so that you can, you know, put the different on different programs. How we can help, this is on that handout. Um, but yeah, we put out, we do free audits for you guys. Um, we will rebate you guys 50% the cost of recommended irrigation parts that come from that audit. Um, and then for landscape, we do life after lawn, dollar a square foot um, for anything that you would convert out of cool season turf. And uh, we also have a plant website. Um, we're in the process of actually switching it over a little bit, but um, it's also, it's just a great resource for knowing like, am I putting in a medium water plant or am I putting in a very low, like, I don't know. Um, it's a good resource for that. And then a kind of additional ones that are great, again, on that handout, um, all of these are good are good resources. This Toro drip tips is nice for um, kind of digestible small little chunks of explaining drip. Um, the two apps, um, they're obviously gonna, they're, you can say I'm doing shrubs, they're, my total square foot is 800, uh, and they're all about four feet apart. You can put in all this information um, and it'll kick you back with, with like, well, we think you need 200 feet of our tech line and um, you need this many connectors. And I mean, they're promoting their products. So like 100%, like you're only gonna get recommended that, but it's good for you to maybe keep in mind that like that's the amount of stuff I might need. Um, and then the, the regional websites, again, kind of just good for researching um, plants and plant water needs um, in the region. And... <laughs> And, and I do have all sorts of bits and bobs up here for you guys to come take a peek at. Um, if they're kind of fiddly enough that I won't really necessarily pass them around. Um, but one thing I will specifically note is that a tackle box is the most perfect drip irrigation storage device there is. Um, I really do recommend that. Um, yeah, questions? Come here. Yeah. Have you, but you found the valves 
and but you don't know which valves serve the drip zones. Yeah, I would say that the having a filter associated with any sort of drip line is um, the standard. It's possible that that was installed using value engineering. Um, it's possible that it was installed um, before maybe that became a little more commonly understood and knowledge. Also, Greeley has great water. It has fantastic water. So people may make the argument that like, well, I'm clean. I'm not using non-potable water. So like, why do I need a filter? Um, people could come up with all reasons to not have it, but um, the, the standard is to, to have that filter and that pressure reducer, um, both of those components. They just get clogged um, really easily. I feel like maybe you get one good season out of them. Um, especially, I, I think they can make sense. Um, I think soaker hoses can make sense for a vegetable garden, but if you're gonna do anything where you bury it under mulch or rock or anything like that, like it's just, it's gonna get clogged real soon. And then you have to pull it back out. And it away. So yeah, they have their place, but maybe just not in a permanent installation. Like line, 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 okay. And what I think he is converting the outside two lines to the grip, but keeping the middle section of the trees with the so question was about having parallel um, lines of irrigation wanting to potentially keep the um, the middle line to serve just the trees and um, converting the outside to to drip um, I would still recommend converting all of it to drip um, and or maybe maybe you can get away with just the two and abandon the other one but um, we're only going to come across more and more watering, uh, you know, more severe droughts, restrictions that eventually, you know, get more and more severe. Um, if you have something that's drip, it's underground, we're going to be more lenient about how that gets watered um, because it's a more efficient way to water. Um, and so I would hate for your trees to somehow get like doinked by the overhead irrigation restriction that could happen. I'm not saying it is, but it could happen in the future um, whenever they do still need that water um, versus if it were on drip, then you're golden. So I would, I would still make that conversion. Yeah. Yeah, a great option. And if it's literally, those are the only two things that you would want to water off, to, off that middle zone, I would bet you could just abandon that middle zone. Um, and potentially just do the other two. Because all you're doing then is adding one tree, um, tree drip, um, compo well, two of them, I guess. Um, and that's not that much water. Um, again, do your calculations. But I bet you could kind of just abandon that middle one. Well, you know, keeping them in the shade and keeping water. I've done that. You're not gone. I've done that. What else? What else? Does anybody know like their the method they would try? Like, I know I'm definitely going to do this version. Okay. <laughs> if, if anybody is um, interested in doing the uh, valve assembly, the one thing I would mention, again, I said like cut out more than you think. Um, there's something called a slip fix that is just, it's, um, it work, works kind of like a periscope um, and it, it makes um, making those connections a lot easier. Um, and that way you're not prying anything or accidentally breaking anything. You will still need to use some couplers to make some connections, but um, it's just, it's, a fantastic product. <laughs> so I recommend them <laughs> for sure. 
Well, if that's it, um, like I said, I've got all sorts of stuff up here that you're welcome to play with. Um, that yeah, come on up and ask me questions in private, whatever, whatever you'd like. Thanks for your time.